Thank you, Chris Murray, for coming to visit us and to, um, and to talk with us about um, uh, the Higher Education Act. I, um, I want to introduce you all to Chris. Uh, he's a founding partner of Thompson Coburn's Lobbying and Policy Group. Uh, his practice focuses on the political and regulatory issues affecting the education sector. He has extensive experience representing institutions, associations, and companies related to e-learning, uh, Title IV program compliance, medical education, federal workforce and military education programs, education technology, international trade and accreditation. Chris is a fr frequent speaker and author on various education policy topics, most often on the intersection of technology and education. Um, so I'm just very thrilled that you came, that there was no snowstorm that prevented any of our speakers from, from getting here. You're from Washington, um, and thank you very much for coming, everybody. Chris Miller. Chris thank you, somebody. Murray. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me here, and thank you, uh, everybody, for having me. I, it, can you hear me, or is that a little bit weird? Is there a little bit of weirdness on the, okay, good, okay. Um, there's a little feedback up here. Uh, this is not a strange place for me to be. I, I grew up in Rockland County in, in a little town called Piermont. I swam a lot at Rockland Community College. I heard that mentioned earlier. Uh, I grew up in a family of swimmers, so we came upstate all the time. I remember I woke up this morning and the first thing I thought of is begging my dad to go to Denny's outside the uh, Holiday Inn we used to stay in in Syracuse, so this is a very comfortable place for me to be. Um, the only problem with being in Syracuse today is the Congress is trying, or the House of Representatives is trying to pass their version of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is their update to No Child Left Behind today. I was watching C-SPAN late last night and sending a lot of text messages to my staff asking about questions on amendments and processes and why this person's doing this and that. Um, so it's, it's been an exciting and fun time in D.C. But uh, the reason why I'm here today is to frame uh, the federal congressional side of policy, specifically the Higher Education Act. So I'm going to uh, break my talk down into three parts. The first part is a brief history of the HEA. I'm going to go through uh, how we got to the HEA in our history. Uh, and then uh, move over to what the process looks like to pass the, the HEA. I don't want to provide too much of a civics lesson, as I'll say later, but I do want to actually get, get you familiar with the process so you know when you read news clips what exactly what means. And then finally, I'll get into the players, which probably matters the most because it's the legislators that actually pass this law and um, whether they're motivated to do so or not motivated to do so will really drive the entire conversation. They will be the ones who put the provisions into the law, and that's really what impacts all of us the most. So, um, so in summary, I'll be getting to why, why the HEA is important, how it gets passed, and who will be passing it. So I'm going to start with kind of the history of higher ed policy from the federal level, which I personally find really interesting. So the HEA authorizes a broad array of federal student aid programs. Uh, HEA programs help students and their families pay for, pay for or finance the cost of post-secondary education. And HEA programs also provide direct aid to institutions of higher ed. So it's not just to students, it's also to institutions. So going back before the original 1965 HEA, the federal government still played a major role in higher education policy, the most, uh, or a more major role in higher education policy than most people realize. Uh, Land-grant institutions were founded in the 19th century with the Morrill Acts, which was, of course, very relevant for New York. Um, and they were first signed into law by President Lincoln. The first Federal Bureau of Education was actually founded in 1868. In the 20th, 20th century, the federal government moved away from providing aid in the form of land to, different, to providing di different types of opportunities. Um, the next really big hallmark moment was in 1994 when President FDR signed the GI Bill, which resulted in a, a tremendous increase in higher ed enrollment. It was nearly a 100% increase as a result of the GI Bill in higher ed enrollment in the years after the Second World War. I mean, that is unbelievable. But, however, that growth and opportunity was limited largely to white men while uh, obstacles persisted for women and minorities for many decades to come. In 1946, President Truman convened what was called the Truman Commission to analyze the role of the educational system in the transition out of the Second World War 
for policy dorks like me, this is a, this was a very, very interesting uh, political panel. Eleanor Roosevelt was on it. It got very, very heated. Um, oftentimes, it looked like it was going to break up. Um, but uh, and, and you know issues like college access and segregation and whether women and minorities should even be going to college in the first place were part of this. I mean, it, this was a big, big moment in the history of higher ed. The final report um, was issued in 1947, and it proposed generous financial aid to students academically qualified to benefit from college. Uh, at the time, Congress didn't act on the Truman Commission, but many of the pieces of the Truman Commission uh, report in 1947 would, would be uh, the, the foundations and be, would essentially be the predicate for the Higher Ed Act uh, almost 20 years later. Uh, in 1958, in an effort to promote, uh, uh, promote um, attainment in math, science, and foreign language that might help the U.S. win the Cold War, uh, fields that, of course, are again relevant here again in 2012, President Eisenhower signed into law the National Defense Education Act. Mm -hmm. A key element of that law was the program would that would later be the Perkins Loan Program um, and other uh, programs that made their way into the HEA, like some of the federal TRIO programs that you might be aware of, like Work Study and Upward Bound, actually predated the original 1965 HEA. Uh, President Johnson signed the Higher Education Act into law on November 8, 1965 uh, in Texas at his alma mater, what was then st Southwest has Texas State College, um, but is now uh, Texas State University. Uh, he signed it actually at the desk that he worked at when he was a janitor at that institution, and that's how he paid his way through college. So uh, November 65, we're in February, the end of February 2015, so we're just about 50 years away from the original Higher Education Act anniversary. Um, the president had taken a personal role in shaping, in the shaping and passage of the HEA. He signed the bill um, at that same desk, which to me was, was, was such a, a momentous and monumental occasion that you know, he came back to the same place that he had, had struggled to finish college. Um, and you know, we have so many presidents through our history that went to Harvard and Yale, um, and you know, uh, LBJ certainly had his problems as president, but I, I think that, that that's a pretty remarkable statement that he went back to, to his state college um, and, and took the pride in signing that law at that time. So uh, the HEA, HEA was one of the centerpieces of his Great Society agenda. Its goal was to take away cost as a barrier to educational attainment. The HEA accomplished this by greatly expanding the federal role uh, in financing higher education. Uh, the HEA also included outreach programs designed to help the most economically disadvantaged students. Uh, so perhaps the biggest controversy on Capitol Hill in the 1960s and the negotiations in the original HEA was whether the bill should include tax credits, which were favored by Republicans, or grants, which were favored by Democrats. Eventually, Democrats got the grant program that they wanted, but as a compromise, the Republicans settled for the Guaranteed Student Loan Program. Title IV is the most ambitious section of the HEA. Uh, it was then, and I would argue is still now. It provides financial, students for, uh, financial assistance for students in higher education through need-based grants, student loans, work-study program, and other campus-based aid. Uh, in its present form, the HEA is organized into eight titles. Uh, most importantly, Title I is general provisions. Title II, three, and five are uh, aid to support institutions directly. And as I mentioned, Title IV is uh, student federal financial aid. Since its elevation in 1980 to a cabinet level department, the U.S. Department of Ed administers HEA programs. The department promulgates regulations to implement the HEA, as I'm sure uh, you are all very, very well aware, uh, and takes various actions to enforce the HEA. Uh, Cong Congress frequently amends and extends the HEA, most often known as HEA reauthorizations. The HEA requires periodic renewal or else it expires, so it will actually be expiring later this year. So Congress must either act to reauthorize the law or extend it for a period of time while Congress does its work on uh, reauthorizing the law. Um, these authorization, reauthorizations sometimes result in very minor changes to the law and sometimes are uh, very, very major uh, changes such as the one that, uh, that, that included the Pell Grant for the first time. So I'm going to go through uh, a quick summary of the HEA, uh, HEA reauthorizations in the past to let you know kind of how we got to uh, where we are now. Uh, in 68, uh, the first reauthorization occurred. It was just three years after the 1965 uh, original authorization. It solidified and expanded the federal student aid programs, and the TRIO programs were formally codified into law that year. 
1972, President Nixon signed the reauthorization into law that created the Basic Educational Opportunity Grant, which would later be named the Pell Grant after Senator Clay Warren Pell of Rhode Island. Um, this 1972 legislation took a giant step forward in reducing the cost for low-income students and, and opened the doorway to millions and millions of students into college. Uh, the 1976 reauthorization was not uh, very, uh, very important compared to the 72. It did not make very, very many significant uh, changes in the overall structure of the federal student aid programs. Um, and the changes then primarily related to needs requirements, um, you know, how many middle income students could, could uh, access aid, how many high income students could access aid. Uh, in 1980, uh, the Congress wrote the 80 reauthorization in the midst of a recession and riding, rising student aid costs in that environment. Uh, similar to the one we have now, Congress instead chose to focus on tweaks to the law that could rein in cost. Congress did add a new program in 1980, the Parent Plus program, which is designed to address the concern that HEA programs have too, had pushed too much of the cost of higher education to students. So it, it brought parents into the equation as well. And obviously, that has been something um, that's been a big deal uh, uh, regulatorily from the department's perspective for the last few, few years. Uh, the lead up to the 86 reauthorization was characterized by political gridlock, which seem, should seem familiar to all of us. Um, but the final result was a law that accomplished two starkly different objectives. It restricted access to loan programs to limit overall program cost, but it also allowed more students to access more money than ever. Uh, 92 was one of the biggest reauthorizations uh, in the history of the law, probably the most important to this community and anyone involved in e-learning. Uh, so there were three kind of watershed issues that happened then. Um, the first was with grants uh, failing to keep pace with college costs, students had become increasingly dependent on student loans. So middle and high income students could now access Stafford loans uh, minus the in-school subsidy. Second, Congress created the direct loan program, which effectively uh, inserted the Department of Education as a bank in the lending system to lend directly to students along the, alongside the private student loan companies that were operating the Stafford loan program. And third, and as I alluded to, uh, most important to this community, the 92 reauthorization allowed uh, Title IV funds for distance learning uh, for the first time. Senator Kennedy, who was chairman of the HELP Committee at the time, was skeptical of distance learning, and he imposed a 50% cap on uh, the number of e-learning programs that an institution could operate, um, and uh, known as the 50% rule. The 50% rule restricted access um, to institutions that either enrolled less than 50% less than of its students or offered less than half of its courses via um, distance learning. Uh, that was, was obviously a very important moment, a little bit of history there. Um, my colleague, Ken Solomon, who has been doing uh, higher education law and lobbying for many, many decades, uh, worked on that, was actually the, the person who led the charge in the 92 reauthorization to allow distance education students access to Title IV for the first time. What's really interesting is that uh, at that moment, uh, the, the entity that paid for that lobbying project was Liberty University and Jerry Falwell, um, which most people don't know, and we should all be very thankful for Jerry Falwell. Um, it's pretty incredible because he had gotten into a federal student aid liability issue because they had started a, a, one of the first distance education programs, and the department came calling in the early 90s saying, pay back millions and millions in, of dollars in student loans. So they got a temporary repeat brief through the appropriations process, and um, through a lobbying effort, Ken and, and, and our colleagues um, were able to get Title IV aid specifically written into the law for distance learning students for the first time. And Ken always talks about, you know, at the time he would call, you know, Harvard and SUNY and, and UPenn to try to get them on board with, with, with this project. And he would say, hey, you know, my name is Ken Solomon. You might remember me from, from uh, our old firm, Dow Lonis now, uh, Thompson Coburn. Um, I represent Jelly, Jerry Falwell. Please don't hang up. <laughs> um, but he, they clearly did their job because they opened the pathway for institutions and students for the last uh, 22 years and, and, and for, for the indefinite future. Uh, the 98 reauthorization, which was six years after 92, obviously, um, made scores of relatively minor changes to already existing Title IV programs. But there was a really important uh, aspect of the 98 reauthorization for, again, for this community, which was the Distance Education Demonstration Program, which is a demonstration program that, that gave lift to uh, uh, nonprofit institutions that wanted to enter into distance learning. Uh, that was really what got Western Governors its start and its lift. So uh, that, was, that was a monumental program that was 
was relatively tiny at the time but had a huge long-term impact. Uh, the longest intervening period between HA reauthorizations was between 98 and 2008. Uh, during this period, authorization for HA programs were incrementally extended by Congress, usually by year, year reauthorizations at a time. Um, the HEOA, as it was last called, the Higher Education Opportunity Act, um, was a lot like its predecessor. It made a lot of small tweaks, but didn't make any kind of large-scale, huge changes uh, to the Higher Education Act. Uh, Congress also sometimes makes big changes to the HEA and, um, and higher ed programs outside of the Higher Education Act, although it almost, almost always does happen inside the Higher Education Act. The 2006 of the extension of the, of the HEA, so that law that extended it for an incremental period of time, repealed that 50% rule that Senator Kennedy was so, was so adamant about putting in the, in the 92 reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, so that was really the culmination of probably a decade and a half of work to show that you know online is being done by nonprofits. It's good work, and that cap should be lifted. Um, another example of large scale, large scale change outside reauthorization was the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997. That law added tax credits to the HEA in the form of the Hope and Lifetime Learning Scholarship or Hope and Lifetime Learning Credits. Republicans had been arguing uh, in favor of tax credits for decades, uh, back to the original HEA of 1965. Uh, major changes are also made outside of uh, the authorization process, process that I'll get into a minute, uh, via what's called a budget reconciliation member. The bu oh, sorry, budget reconciliation measure. The budget re reconciliation process is excruciatingly arcane. You don't want to know about it. Um, I'll spare you the details, but it essentially allows a certain type of bill to avoid the filibuster in the Senate, so it only needs 50 votes to pass. So you might remember in, uh, in, the, uh, in the wake of Obamacare, what the House and Senate did were they passed their versions of the law, but then there was a, a subsequent law after Scott Brown um, came in uh, and won the special election to replace Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts, and that, that reduced the Democrats' number in the Senate from, from 60 to 59, so they no longer had that filibuster-proof majority. Um, so uh, the Democrats needed to pass that fixes bill to actually get Obamacare across the finish line. Um, and that was done by a budget reconciliation measure. And tucked in that budget reconciliation me measure that was really about Obamacare um, was uh, a piece of legislation called SAFRA, which eliminated the Stafford loan program in favor of the direct loan program. Um, which just goes to show you there are different measures that, that can have huge impacts on the higher ed system at large that are not just not in the, uh, the HEA. So I'm going to conclude our little history of the HEA here uh, with some takeaways. So all the essential components of the HEA started in the 65 HEA and, and live on today. But what's really amazing is that the conversation doesn't seem to have moved forward very much on Capitol Hill over the last 50 years. We're debating the same issues over and over again, um, and we'll probably uh, debate very similar issues this time around. So what are those issues? Whether to provide grants, loans, or tax credits how much aid to provide middle and high income students, the deepening direct involvement of the federal government, and finally the growth and number, uh, growth and num in number of the HEA programs and their related costs, most notably Pell, which in, last year, in the last few years has seen a big explosion in its overall cost. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn to the legislative process. And as I said before, I don't want this to be a civics lesson. Um, I'll get through it as quickly as I can. I just want to make sure when you read news clips about what this senator did or what that senator did, um, you, you have a, a better framing of, of where we are in the process. So um, there are two kind of threshold aspects to what Congress does. Congress appropriates and uh, it authorizes. Authorization is when Congress passes a particular law. So the HEA is an, is, a, is an authorization done by authorizing committees. Appropriations occur when Congress determines how much money to spend on a particular law. So for example, uh, con Congress uh, in the, the authorizing committees of Congress can say uh, the Pell Grant should be $6,000 per student. The appropriators can then say, we don't really care. Uh, it can be $12,000 a student or it can be $4,000 a student. Uh, so the appropriators determine how much money to spend on those authorization programs, but very often it doesn't match up with what the, what the, uh, what the authorization actually says. Um, appropriations should happen every year, unlike, 
uh, authorizations, which happen um, uh, more periodically, like the HEA. Um, but uh, we've had a very dysfunctional Congress, um, as everybody knows. Uh, the, the regular order process of appropriations has been broken down for many, many years. Actually, we have uh, most staff on Capitol Hill now are so young that they've never, never been through a regular order appropriations process, which is very sad to me. Um, uh, and what we do now are lots of stopgap measures to fund parts of the government uh, for this period of time or that period of time without actually going through the deliberative process of deciding, okay, how much money should we be spending on education programs alone? What money should we be spending that on? Let's deliberate it and pass it. No, it turns out to be, you know, in the dead of night, uh, up to, to a deadline with the shutdown of the government looming or the government actually shut down. You know, let's horse trade everything and, and throw everything into a last minute law. Um, that's not good politics. It's not good policy. Um, and I hope we move back towards regular order sometime soon. Um, so the Ed Workforce and Help Committees are the uh, Ed Workforce Committee in the House and the Help Committee in the Senate are the authorizing committees uh, in Congress. And the Appropriations Committees are driven by uh, the Education Subcommittees on the Appropriations Committees. Um, so now that I've, I've kind of bored you with the difference between appropriations and authorization, um, I'm going to just get into a little bit of the process of how a law like the HEA moves, moves through uh, committees and then into passage and finally si signage into, sign in into law by the president. So uh, what happens is the, the, the House and the Senate tend to pass their own versions of the bill. So the House Ed Workforce Committee will, uh, will have, have a series of hearings that will float their bill, they will amend it in committee, amend it on the, on the House floor, and then pass that bill. Mm -hmm. And then the Senate will do the same thing. They will, uh, they will have a draft bill, they will amend it in the committee, amend it on the Senate floor, and then pass that bill. Well, then you have two separate bills uh, that need to somehow be reconciled. And although this doesn't always happen, it's, it's very typical for um, HEA for there to be a conference committee, which is the, which is the body that reconciles the two bills. So the conference committee uh, has conferees. So those are, those are legislators appointed by the leadership of the House and the Senate. And those are usually um, policy experts within the ranks of the, of the representatives and senators. So an example is, um, you know, the Republicans control the House. Uh, and uh, John Klein is, is, is the chair of the Ed Workforce Committee. Um, the subcommittee chair on higher education is, is, uh, is a, representative of, a representative named Virginia Fox of North Carolina. Um, representative Fox is a PhD. She uh, is a former college president uh, and obviously has a very kind of deep knowledge of our sector. So she's the type of person, um, I don't have any intelligence of this, I don't know this for a fact, but she's the type of person you would expect to be appointed as a conferee because she really does know um, the lay of the land in higher education. So then what the conferees do is the, the leadership appoints them um, proportionally, roughly, um, so that the, you know, whatever party has control is the one that has the most votes, so it would now be Republicans in both the House and the Senate. They go into a conference, they essentially lock them in a conference room for weeks, and they debate, uh, you know, this provision is in the House bill, this provision is in the Senate bill, how do we marry the two, how do we pick what, what goes into the final law. That, that, get, that's, that then gets passed, and that, gets, get, that then gets sent to uh, the president for his signature. So there's several steps in the process. Obviously, there's the, the committee process, the floor process, the, the conference committee process. Um, all are important parts of HEA reauthorization. Um, but to me, probably the most important part is the part that gets it across the finish line right at the end, the conference committee process. Um, and these are all opportunities for you to go in and talk to your legislators if there's something that comes in in, every, in any particular point that really concerns you. So my last section here are the players. So who, who are the decision makers? Why is uh, the HEA moving now? Um, and what should we expect in this reauthorization? So in the House, longtime Congressman John Klein of Minnesota is chairman of the Education and the Workforce Committee. He received a waiver to have one more term as chair of uh, that committee. Uh, some, some parties, uh, it works in, in different ways, um, have term limits on how long you can be chair um, in the House and the Senate. Um, so he received that waiver, I, I think in large part because leadership recognizing the fact that you know, he's been around a while, um, he knows the lay of the land, and a lot can happen in this Congress. Um, he's a pragmatist. He's a well-known well -known friend of the for-profit sector. Um, and he has a very kind of long-tenured, experienced staff who have been with him for a long time. Um, 
Uh, the ranking member, which is the, the term for the, the senior most person in the party that's out of power, so that's the Democrats in both the House and the Senate, the ranking member on Ed Workforce is Bobby Scott of Virginia. Um, he uh, somewhat unexpectedly became ranking member. Several of the members above him in seniority uh, retired late last year, uh, a couple of them unexpectedly. So um, he kind of came into that position uh, surreptitiously. He's, he's learning the rules of the road. He's been on the committee a long time and knows a lot about higher education, but um, you know, he's still staffing up and, and getting, getting his feet wet as you know, the lead Democrat on the committee. That, that's a big role and an important role. Um, he himself has been a pretty uh, vocal critic of certain parts of um, the regulatory process at the Department of Ed, uh, particularly gainful employment. Um, so um, as I alluded to before, uh, Congress is working at breakneck speed on education uh, legislation this year. First up is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is under consideration, uh, as I mentioned today. It's, I'm going to be passing the House. Uh, they're whipping right now and hoping to pass the, the bill today. Um, apparent, uh, uh, the, the law is, is, is pretty far right. Um, I guess the Republicans' uh, leadership um, are, are, might lose some of the far, far right folks because it's not far right enough. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's familiar to anybody who, who watches the news or, or, or reads um, the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, and uh, yesterday there was a long amendment process on the floor um, where amendments were offered by both Republicans and Democrats to, to, to improve the bill. Um, so that's up first. Uh, the next step would be uh, the Senate on ESEA, um, as, uh, ESEA is the, the, as I mentioned, the K-12 law, but it, it was most recently known as uh, No Child Left Behind in 2002. Um, uh, the next stop is the Senate. It's going to be very, it's going to be a very different process in the Senate. Um, Lamar Alexander is the chairman of the, uh, of the Senate Help Committee. He's a new chairman. Uh, he just came into this role. He is, I would argue, the, the most experienced person when it comes to higher education policy in the U.S. Congress. He was the uh, U.S. Secretary of Education. He was the president of the University of Tennessee system. Um, he really knows education soup to nuts. Um, I had breakfast with him just yesterday morning. I mean, it is, it is amazing when you sit with him and what a commanding presence he has and what a commanding um, understanding of the issues are. Um, there's no kind of educating and trying to you know, wade into the waters. I mean, he knows your issue um, just like that from, from the beginning. So um, Lamar Alexander is the chair. Uh, the ranking, new ranking member on that committee is Senator Perry, Patty Murray of Washington. She is an incredibly hard worker. She's a great legislator. Uh, the, her leadership in the, the Senate has frequently turned to her as the person to solve big problems. She was chair, the co-chair of the Super Committee. She, uh, you might recall, was the person that worked directly with Paul Ryan, um, kind of famously struck up a friendship with him and struck a budget deal two years ago. Um, so she is a legislator's legislator um, who really, uh, who really got, takes that part of her job seriously, as does Lamar Alexander. So um, you have um, a little bit of a shift there as well. Tom Harkin was uh, the, the chair for the last several years for the Democrats. Um, he uh, spent a lot of time going after the for-profit sector. Um, and for better or worse, he didn't do a whole lot of legislating in our area. Um, it, he did, there were a lot of hearings and there was a lot of press, but there wasn't a lot of actual legislation happening. And, and that, that, is, that is very much shift, shifted. Um, on ESEA, and, and I know I keep on talking about it, but it's important as a, as a predicate for, for what will happen in HEA, um, Lamar Alexander has been going around and meeting with Senate uh, Democrats who are on the Help Committee and having long meetings with them saying, please stay with the process. There will be an open amendment process when we mark up the bill in the, in the uh, Help Committee. There will be an open amendment process on the Senate floor. You will get to be heard. I want a bipartisan bill. So while the House bill is fairly you know, far right, Lamar Alexander is trying to do everything he can to work directly with, with Senator Murray and try to keep everybody together um, so that a, a good bill comes out of of the help committee because he's aware that the bill that, pa that passes the house is unlikely to be signed by the president um, and also um, you know Lamar Alexander is definitely a Republican and he's definitely a conservative Republican but he's also kind of an old-school senator uh, he very much believes in the amendment process and working across the aisle and working with friends in the way that, that the kind of Senate should work and the, the way that it used to work um, I learned something really interesting uh, 
uh, recently that, that, that really shocked me. When No Child Left Behind passed uh, the Senate in 2002, it was debated for six weeks on the floor of the U.S. Senate, which was the second longest debate in the history of the U.S. Senate after the Civil Rights Act, which is, to, to me, astonishing. Um, I don't think it's going to be six weeks this time, but you should really be paying attention uh, in the news when you're hearing about K-12 law as, it, as it's taking shape, because if that process breaks down, um, I would also expect the, the, the HEA process to later uh, break down. But like I said, Lamar Alexander is kind of clutching to everything he can to get this through. Um, and so why would he do that? Why would he care so much? Um, why would uh, John Klein ask for and receive the waiver? Um, so. Uh, that these politicians know their politics. And um, 2016 is going to be a better year for Democrats for several reasons. Democrats do better in presidential elections because of um, the demographics of the United States. Um, but also, uh, the, there are more Democrats up for uh, real, there are more Republicans up for re-election, and it's a better Senate map for Democrats in 2016 than it's been for many years. So. It is entirely feasible that the Democrats retake the Senate in 2016. So Lamar Alexander might only have two years as help chairman. So, and so for someone who's kind of at the, uh, at the later stage of his career, he's not at the end of his career, it is the, late, the later stage of his career, who has uh, you know, had all of these illustrious jobs, for him to finally get to be chairman of the Senate Help Committee and then squander the opportunity of passing the monumental pieces of legislation in K-12 and higher ed would be an entirely lost opportunity on his part. Um, he has not told me this. I have not read this in, in reports. I'm just, I'm surmising this from, you know, his deep passion and commitment uh, to education and just looking at um, the schedule uh, that seems to be breakneck uh, at this moment, trying to get both of these laws passed through this year. Um, so I've gone on and on. I'd like to open the floor to some questions uh, that you might have about how the politics and process are working, what to expect, particularly for, for online learning, but, but really anything that interests you in different aspects of HEA reauthorization, Congress, uh, the federal government. I think it's... Uh fairly easy to get feel disenfranchised you know as a voter these yeah. days I'm curious what advice you have in order to take an advocacy position with a local representative or to somehow or the other be influential as a very small voice yeah you know I, I that that's an aspect of the process that I I, I don't feel quite as skeptical about um, because at the end of the day these folks who are in Congress still have to go and get elected every two or six years. And I think a, a big part of the problem is often um, folks not realizing that their members really do want to hear from them. So if there's a town hall in your district, if there is uh, an opportunity for you to be in Washington and just you know go in and see see your member of Congress or their staff, they very much want to hear from you. I, I, something happened uh, about a year ago that that astounded me, and I'm not going to mention the institution's name. It was a prominent Research One institution with a large e-learning operation, and um, as a favor, we took them in to see their representatives, uh, uh, their representative and their senators. Um, they had been doing this online operation for years. None of the staff, and neither of the n none of the uh, the, rep the elected officials knew that they had any online programs. I mean, the fact that that message had not broken through to them at all, whether you know someone just shook their hand at an event and said, "Hey, I work for you know Open SUNY, or I I work at this institution, and and I'm the dean of online learning, or the, I'm the chief online learning officer," is astounding to me. So I think uh, something that's been missing for years in, 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 in our little online world is, is congressional outreach. Uh, ACE and all the other trade associations do a great job at, at being umbrella organizations, but none really has online learning as their only policy goal. So they'll put it in in a long list of other things that matter to them, but it's closer to the bottom of the list than the top. 
And as a result, I think there's much more grassroots, grassroots work we all need to do to educate members of Congress about what's happening out there. Um, the, the staff in Congress are largely very intelligent, but they're also largely very traditional. They've gone to uh, traditional institutions of higher education, usually top institutions of higher education, and have been residential to 18 to 22 year olds. Um, so their experience and knowledge about what the majority of higher education looks like um, is almost nil. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier for us, but, but we've all got to, as a community, go in and, and make sure that the legislators and their staff know that we're out there. What do you think will happen with gainful employment? Oh, that's that's a really really interesting one. Um, so there there are several there are several aspects here. Uh, I'll give you the the alternatives, and I'm not sure I can give you what what will actually happen. So first of all, there's a lawsuit. So uh, the lawsuit last time threw out a portion of the of the reg. I don't think the Department of Ed necessarily has enough time to go through round three of gainful employment. So if the lawsuit um, was successful, then I think uh, the the rule might die. Um, uh, if the lawsuit's unsuccessful, it might be a multi-year appeal process. I also don't know whether the department is going to want to spend the resources on, um, on years and years of litigation. That's a great question for the Department of Ed representative coming up, Joe Sal. Um, no, 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 don't, don't ask him that, please. Um, but um, so, so there, there are a couple other things that can happen this year with Gainful. Um, uh, there, there's a, a bipartisan group in the House that is pretty interested in getting rid of gainful employment. So both the chairman and the ranking member of the Ed Workforce Committee want to kill gainful employment. Um, there was a bipartisan bill that was introduced to, um, to put on hold gainful employment, state authorization, credit hour, and the rating system until the HEA is reauthorized. That was um, led by Virginia Fox, who I mentioned before, in the House, and was just introduced, uh, I think, yesterday by Senator Burr in the Senate. Um, he's from North Carolina, too. Uh, so uh, those bills are floating around, but what actually happens to them? So I, I think there, there, there are a couple things. So the first is that there's an appropriations process. So when Congress passes an appropriations law, they can say um, either no money can be used on gainful employment or no money can be used on gainful employment until the authorizing committee has a chance to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. Um, during which time the Republicans could very well just cut the words gainful employment out of the law and there'd be no statutory basis for the rule in the first place, um, which I think is, is pretty likely um, whenever we get there. Um, and um, uh, another, another thing that could happen, but as I mentioned, the appropriations process is completely off the rails. Who knows when that will happen? Um, uh, another option is that there will have to be an extension to the HEA and um, whether in that extension to the HEA, um, sometimes those are clean and they just say extend the law for one year, and sometimes, they, like, like in 2006, they say extend the law for a year, oh, and get rid of the 50% rule. So this one could say extend the law for a year, oh, and by the way, kill these four uh, programs or kill these four regs or kill these four regs until HEA reauthorization fully happens. Um, that to me, just, just, just as, as an observer and someone who's involved with all this, seems really fun because um, Congress would then pass uh, a law and the president would have to say, say, well, do I keep all the funding flowing to institutions and the, billion, the billions and billions of dollars in Pell Grants and loans, um, or do I stand up for these rules that, that a lot of people have been complaining about? You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting politics, but, you know, the Republicans might also say, you know, we don't want to back the president into a corner yet again because we can't keep on looking like the obstructionist party. I mean, I don't know who, any, if anyone's flying out today, but I would, I would fly out today and not tomorrow because who knows what happens with the Department of Homeland Security because um, they have no money at the end of today. Um, so so, so that, that's an option. And then finally, it's does, does Congress, do, does this House and this Senate reauthorize the HEA in this Congress because uh, I believe that would look a lot w with this president that uh, whatever final bill would would probably remove the term gainful employment and do something about gainful employment permanently um, and they would have to make the rest of that bill palatable enough to the president that he would want to sign it um, or uh, you know, it, does it does it go to you know the, the Hillary Clinton years um, and um, or or whoever is the next president um, and and uh, does does the does the rule stand for some time? So th there are a lot of questions and it's just something we've all got to pay attention to. Somebody had a question over there. Yeah, thanks. I've, this has been a really really nice introduction. I did not know any of those details okay. about the law. 
So, but my question is, do you think, and this would really be probably for K-12 as well as higher ed, mm. do you think that people fully understand the impact of the regulatory requirements and mandate on the educational mission? Because I know every time we have to do another report, another bit of detail, buy another program, hire another administrator, we can't hire another instructional designer, teacher, student support person. We can't do those things. Do people understand that? Is, do you think there will be any change? Um, so I, I don't want to base too much on what just happened because we have to see how it all plays out. But, but I, I think this, I don't know if anyone saw it uh, last week, this report came out or two weeks ago. Um, Lamar Alexander convened a task force uh, from the Senate Health Committee that was two Democrats and two Republicans. So uh, Alexander, Senator Burr, uh, and uh, as Republicans, uh, Barbara Mikulski from, from Maryland and uh, Michael Bennett from Colorado as Democrats. They worked together in their staff um, and they brought a whole bunch of external institutions and entities in to analyze exactly that, bureaucratic creep, um, how difficult the process is from a compliance standpoint. Um, and then they came out uh, just recently with a report on, on exactly this issue. Well, the, the ACE took the leading or on putting the report together. The two chairs were from Vanderbilt and from the University of Maryland system. I mean, it's, it's to me a pretty blistering read on, on over-regulation, on, on activist regulation, how difficult it is to uh, operate an institution of higher ed in these circumstances. Um, just during the hearing this week, uh, there was a hearing on, on, this, on the, the task force report this past Tuesday. Um, the president of Vanderbilt uh, revealed that, and this is not just for, for HEA, this is for all of their, their federal grants. Um, and all their federal compliance, they spend $142 million a year on compliance. And the University of Maryland roughly guessed it was $225 million. I mean, if, if, if anything is going to animate someone like Lamar Alexander to go into action, it's Vanderbilt saying it costs $142 million to comply with the law. Um, so, um, and, and he says all the time, I mean, he's used this, he's, he's used this, uh, this analogy, um, weeding the garden. Um, and he'll blame himself. He'll say, when I was Secretary of Ed, I added, I added to the weeds. But, you know, we've added 50 years of weeds to the garden, and we've never weeded the garden. And he wants to try to do this. Um, I mean, as, as anyone who knows bureaucracy and knows, uh, knows politics, that's exceedingly hard to do. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of point one one member or another out, but, but I will. Yesterday when I was watching on C-SPAN, the, um, the, the, the uh, debate on uh, ESEA, uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries, who I very much like, um, I have a, a, a prominent charter school client in New York City, um, and, and he, he, he's, a, he's a great member. He's a new member of the Ed Workforce Committee. He's a Democrat. And um, he, uh, he proposed a provision um, in ESEA that requires uh, learning around copyright infringement and you know how students really need to learn about copyright infringement. That's just the kind of thing that to me makes no sense. It's like why is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in your program participation agreement with the, with, the, with the U.S. Department of Ed? I mean it just seems so far afield. Yeah, do I like copyright infringement? Of course not. But does it does it need to be in an education bill? No. Put it in put it in uh, put it in you know other 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 bills. Um, so um, I'm not necessarily optimistic there, but it does seem like finally the message is getting out just how bad it is. But but as with as with everything else, whenever you have the chance to tell somebody about it, do. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Nate Angel from an organization called Lumen Learning that focuses on open educational resources. And I'm going to bypass the copyright thing you brought up <laughs> uh, and, uh, and to ask a different question. And sure. um, do you have any uh, knowledge or focus on how um, federal regulations or thinking around um, competency-based education mm -hmm. might be affected in this uh, debate that's happening right now? Yeah, um, I actually, I'm, I'm writing a, a paper right now with my colleague uh, for the American Enterprise Institute on competency-based education and its regulation. Uh, 
You know, this is an area, and, and, and Joseph Wall is, is a great person to ask this question to as well. Um, this is an area that um, has taken off despite kind of all of the regulatory roadblocks. And when we were doing our research, one thing that really shocked me, shocked me was how creative the institutions that are leading on competency-based education are creating these crosswalks like into uh, credit hours. Because you have to get to credit hours somehow. I mean, even if you're using another another pathway to aid, you still have to get there somehow. And it, it was it was it was kind of this light bulb moment for me because I was thinking, wow, these folks are so creative because this bureaucratic process sucks. And they're and they're just finding they're dancing around it. Um, so I do think competency-based education is going to be part of the overall conversation in HEA, but I don't think it's going to be a, a central topic. There are so many issues with the system right now. There are so many programs. It costs so much money. Um, and uh, you know, even just, just the issue of accreditation. Um, everyone seems to be frustrated with accreditation, but no one seems to know what to do with it. I think we're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what do you do with accreditation, which, of course, has a huge impact on competency-based education. Um, so I think they're going to they're, they're really roll up their sleeves on a, in a lot of areas, but I don't think directly a competency-based education will be one. However, there was the competency-based um, uh, law that passed the House last year, and I think it was unanimous or like one or two votes against it. So obviously this is something, I mean, even, even in the current House environment, everyone likes. So um, it will make its way in there, but I just, I wouldn't expect, you know, on the cover of the New York Times, you know, President Obama signs into law, you know, competency-based education, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. I, I, I think it's going to be a, a second-tier issue. Say thank you to Chris thank Murray you so much. for coming and I mean, this is an thank awesome you everybody. lesson in federal education legislation. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for coming. Um, I am going to try and keep us on track, but we are due a break. So we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll uh, return here to mm -hmm. talk with Joseph South from the Department of Education. Uh, so a uh, short break, everybody.